Okay, we're going to kick this off. Uh, welcome to Mastering Confidence and Absurdness, your physician recruitment superpower presentation for today. So to kind of kick us off, you know, obviously Paul started the kind of the announcement, you know, my name's Clint Rosser. I'm the CEO of Practice Match. Um, and obviously Paul started talking. He is, uh, you know, kind of shifted jobs here recently. He came over. We, we had the pleasure of hiring Paul to kind of take over our uh, internal uh, physician recruitment or sourcing team that we had here. And uh, we've recently kind of moved Paul over into our uh, provider recruitment consultant role. you know, that we've uh, we've kind of created underneath uh, the practice match brand, and it's a well-needed uh, position that we've identified. Um, so we're going to kind of go through and uh, talk about uh, I, what I feel is kind of critical, you know, that we identified as we started to create this presentation earlier this year. Um, I always like to start a presentation. Um, I've been with practice match for eight and a half years. Paul, how long have you been, you know, kind of doing recruitment? I think you're close to 10 years now. 10 years. Yeah. I've been yeah. 10 years. So I, I always like to start saying that I have never sourced a provider. Um, but what I do like is, is that I've always, you know, like to be a student of any, any career that I've ever jumped into. And, and I love to learn from all of you and, and jump in and, and, and love to listen and understand what's going on. And, and as we were going through and trying to think of a topic that would kind of resonate for, you know, 2024 on top of some of the other webinars that the team has created, this one kind of just kind of spoke to Paul and I of, of what is something else that kind of jumps out that doesn't, doesn't really pertain to a product. What doesn't, doesn't, you know, we get you into a webinar and say that, if you do this within a product, that this is going to get you more candidates. Yes, there's tools out there that'll that'll get you you know results. And if you do this, this will be better. But there's these soft skills and and other things that you can improve on that will will pull those results. You know that that we feel, especially with where we see the industry um, currently today, that we feel if you if you work on this, you know, and what we're going to talk about that. you'll be able to gain, you know, some traction and, you know, where, where things are struggling, you know, right now. And I think that's where Paul and I kind of worked through the presentation and built this, you know, would you agree kind of Paul, we're kind of what we built here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. My so, experience, your experience. Yep. Product yeah, neutral. And, and, and always end with it's, I, I, I always feel it's a pleasure to speak to all of you. And, and anytime I get a chance to, to whether it's live or whether it's through a webinar or coming into individual organizations that invite us in. So thank you very much for attending. Um, it's always a pleasure. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Clint. Thanks for the intro. And yep, just to wrap that up, yep, but I had about seven years uh, director of a recruitment team outside of Cleveland, Ohio. And Clint really hasn't talked to many candidates. Uh, uh, definitely got a thousand or more that I've spoken to. So um, mm -hmm. we're excited about sharing our experience with you. So we're going to kick it off. So why this topic and what are the benefits? So when we started going through and, and started to build this out, we said, okay, we're going to build through these, these two main topics and why. And the first one that kind of rang was youth of the profession, not an age. This is years in a row. What we're noticing within practice match in, in particular is we are getting a lot of new users. And the new users aren't necessarily people that are coming from one organization to another. And there are some of that, but we're getting a lot of new sourcers, a lot of new recruiters that are not just new out of college, but just are changing profession. And, and this is something that, you know, kind of getting into, into this area and this niche market is, is we felt that understanding it and getting into this side and, and giving them some knowledge and, and understanding the market is, is important. Um, competition, you know, going after the same pool of, of individuals, um, obviously all of you know, it, it's it, the pool is what it is. So, you know, in introducing some of these soft skills um, definitely will help you. 
Um, in industry trends, um, looking at what, what the increase of using locums and agency, how that is in, impacting your organizations, um, and then how, how we feel that introducing some of this will lower the cost per hire. You know, obviously reducing the vacancy rates um, and then attracting top talent, you know, is kind of what we're looking to benefit from going through this presentation. Next slide, Paul. Yep. Yeah, assertiveness in uh, physician recruitment. Uh, you know, it's not it's not passive or, or aggressive. Uh, it's it's just emotionally honest, direct. Um, you know, the part about the assertiveness, you know, that I saw here for the last three years for our uh, recruitment team here, client sourcing, but also at the hospital level as well. Um, you know, that we do find that, you know, those organizations uh, that do a really good job of keeping their candidates engaged throughout the entire recruitment process are the ones, you know, that do a better job of bringing those candidates to their organization to the point is where, right, they have that opportunity to make a decision on whether to make an offer or not. I mean, I think that all of us on the call could agree you know, that that is really where we want to be with possibly every single candidate is to get them to a place where we've done a great job identifying them on the front end and bringing them to the organization, you know, to hopefully make an offer. Uh, but the assertive conversations, right, the assertiveness in the process is really what's going to make you better than the competition. It is going to set you apart and put you in the much higher performing uh, part of any organization uh, that you're competing for the same physician talent. And that's really why we're excited about talking to this, because it's those conversations that keep those candidates engaged throughout the entire recruitment process uh, that allow you to have that competitive edge. Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's a balance. I think uh, Paul hit on it quite a bit there that there's a difference and and not to call it out, obviously we we know the outside agencies of of that aggressiveness, um, whether they're calling you, um, but the assertiveness is we we see the opposite. You know, we see a lot of individuals, um, even with us with with some of the tools, where you'll get physicians, and we've seen it even with us passing candidates over when they use our service, where we'll pass five, six, seven candidates over, and we're getting calls back, you know, from the candidate saying, I've not heard. And so that's where the assertiveness is, is where we really feel that this is from the newness, in my opinion, of how do we, how do we instill that into the, in, into the conversation? Be assertive, because knowing that you start to lose a candidate if you're not, if you're not pressing on that, you've got to keep that assertiveness into that without being that aggressive individual that turns that individual off a little bit and they go, oh, that's too much. I don't, I don't want to be part of an organization that's putting that much pressure, that much, yeah. you know, not being that, not feeling that I'm not, I'm not wanting that much pressure on me to move along in that process. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, Clint. Um, yeah, before we move on, yeah, it's the same thing, right? We had new uh, members of our client sourcing team up here for the last three years, and it's the same thing. I mean, I would encourage them to uh, take the initiative to, to, when they're engaged with candidates to say, you know what, you know, I think you'd be a good fit for this. I, I I'm going to go ahead and move you, you know, through the process here. Is that okay? You know, to be able to to just ask questions and, and really, again, engage and, uh, you know, encourage the, the, the candidate that they are a good fit, that they, that they should consider the organization and, and move them through rather than asking more like telling, again, being a little bit assertive and telling them that they, they, they should go on and, and continue to stay engaged. Okay. So then when you start looking from a physician recruitment side, and I got to give credit to Paul as he helped build this, you know, you, you look at what am I looking at from a recruitment perspective? And, and really, it starts to boil down to effective communication. I'm, I'm not a slide reader, so, you know, we'll kind of we'll kind of leave this up there for a little bit. And Paul and I'll bounce back and forth and talk about it. But, you know, effective communication is critical. It's keeping in touch is being clear. Um, transparent with that with that candidate as much as you can all the way through the process. Um, it, it it is important that effective communication is also being 
um, effective all the way through it. It's it's being um, on point on how how much you're communicating with them and being following through when you're following up with that individual and and making sure that you're doing it when you tell them you're doing it. Um, when you set the expectations, once again, when you set them, make sure you're following through, being assertive when you're doing it, making sure that you're listening to them um, from that, sta that standpoint. When you set it, follow through, listen to what they're saying, um, you know, listen from a standpoint of what they're asking from, from a growth perspective, what they're asking from a compensation. You know, sometimes you can't meet that, that's fine. But when you're listening to them and you're understanding where they're coming from, that helps from a dissatisfaction perspective, you know, that you might hit later on. Um, also the negotiation skills, very critical from a standpoint that we are seeing through our client account managers to, to a degree that we're getting feedback that that's something that they kind of miss out on. So understanding from a negotiation skills, um, when you start looking at whether you're, you're a hiring manager on here or your, your recruiters, how can you build on that? Uh, I always think of physician recruiters as salespeople um, to a degree because you're selling every single day. You're selling the organization, the community, um, the, uh, the position, and, and many, many more things about, the, about everything to do with the with what you're you're offering to that position. So the negotiating skills are probably close to the top, you know, that you have to be working on. And efficient at decision making. Um, you have to start, you know, working on that immediately from that standpoint. And once again, that has to be, you know, that all boils into that assertiveness as you work through this process. You know, how do you continuously push along that job offer, addressing those concerns as they're raised through the candidate, getting them pushed up to your leadership. You know, any delay that you're having in, mm -hmm. in the process, that candidate mm -hmm. guaranteed is talking to your competition, guaranteed mm -hmm. that they're getting offers from everyone else. So you do not want to lose them. So mm -hmm. the effective decision making, setting the expectation, this all runs together. And so you have to make sure as you're as you're building upon this, that you're being very effective through this. And, and that kind of all builds together with that assertiveness, you know, that you're running through. Do you have anything to add on these four, Paul? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, just to support what you just said, which is, um, you know, keeping the candidate engaged, moving them through the process uh, is just critical. Uh, and here again, I think the most important one on this slide, these are all important, but the one is the setting the expectations. Uh, I can say with confidence, uh, we are seeing candidates right now, and this has been a new trend we've identified over the last 12 months, where candidates have taken jobs and they're about a year and a half into their roles and they're already starting to look for something new or the fact that expectations and reality are not lining up. And uh, it is really the responsibility of the recruitment team and the organization to set those expectations so that the job and the culture and the expectations of the client really do meet what, what's happening at the organization. You know, the other thing too, right, this slide, you know, talks about, you know, three, you know, three additional uh, aspects of assertiveness, right, is, and yeah, definitely maintaining those professional boundaries. You know, uh, I saw what's most effective with uh, recruiting, which is simply, uh, you know, taking the position of being the candidate advocate when you're, you're newly engaging a candidate and moving them through the process. You know, I'm confident there's people on this call that, you know, sometimes it's difficult to get the candidates engaged with the position leadership and the service line, or there may be, you know, an exceptionally long delay in terms of determining the timing of a site visit, right? But it's good to actually have that, you know, uh, assertive, quality, not only with the candidates, but also with the organization, right? Representing the organization to the, to the candidate, having them understand, you know, where you're at in the process, where they are in the process, what the timing will be, but more importantly, again, right? To build that strong pipeline, right? Having the recruitment team, the recruitment leadership, again, knowing that it's important uh, to maintain, you know, the position of the fact that the candidate, you know, really needs to have an advocate to get them through, you know, the process. It was mentioned on the slide before this, and I totally agree. You know, when it comes to negotiations, though, you know, it's best to do what's for the organization, 
right? It's best for from the organization's perspective to have the best um, contract, the best relationship with that position as possible. But again, uh, you know, underlining, you know, how important it is just to make sure that, um, you know, it's okay uh, to ask, you know, in a professional manner, you know, how things are going and, and keep that candidate moving through the process. So then kind of as you move, as we move through this, it's it's now defining a little bit deeper aggression to assertiveness. And and really the first one is let's get it, let's get aggression out of the way. And and really that that aggression is that forceful, pushy, you know, domineering. And and why is that so important? And and really it's defined down there. It's that negative perception. It's it's you don't want a candidate to walk away, whether they take an opportunity or not, you don't want them to start to walk away from an opportunity and talk. It's such a small um, industry already, and the pool is what it is, whether it's a resident, whether it's a fellow, or whether you're you're really recruiting in, within an, an organization where they start to talk. And, and so you want to make sure that that experience, no matter where it's at in the stage or where it's at um, through the process, that it is as positive as, as it can be. So ensuring that that you're not going down that, that that aggressive you know, path is so important because, you know, that will start to they'll start to determine if that's the culture and whether that's right or wrong. That's what they start to look at. They start to think about it from a standpoint of of how ethical is the organization. If if that's the if that's the way or how pushy the pushy the organization is, um, you start to get candidate backlash. You know because if they're getting bombarded with aggressive recruitment and how hostile it could be, they just start to they start to completely think that that's how your your physician group or your 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 hospital organization could be and and it starts to lose that overall trust and i think that's as you think about defining the two you've got to think about that from that overall perception because they take that back they will talk in that circle you know mm -hmm. so when you think about the tactic make sure that you understand don't take it to that extreme it's not and it is a fine line you know that you want to be you want to be that assertive you want to make sure you're staying in front of them but you want to ensure that that when you go through it, that you're not getting to that that point where you you are being to the point of pushy and 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 getting them across that line where you're starting to get a negative a negative candidate experience. Um, you know, because I think Paul might have some some examples of that. But I mean, I think we've all experienced it one way or another, whether it's in a car dealership or anything mm -hmm. that we've seen in the sales side. We've all hit that that negative experience where where um, we went. No, I'm never going to do business with this individual again. I'm never going to go there if that's the way they want to be. Um, I've actually heard candidates say the same thing, whether it's been an AAFP or it's been in another physician, you know, conference or at a career fair. Um, I've actually sat at a career fair and been outside and 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 had had a physician come up and go. Can you tell me where this booth is? I don't want to talk to them. I don't even want them to approach me. And that's mm. sad to see because I thought the organization was fantastic. And I know the recruiters and I think they're fantastic, but they had a bad experience several years ago. Uh, and that's what they keep in their mind. So keep that in, in, in the forefront of really trying to define for yourself the difference between that aggression and assertiveness. Make sure that it's that negative perception is gone. Don't lose that candidate trust. And remember, they're going to look at that and define it themselves. They're going to put the negative perception in there. They're going to have trust issues. It's, you're going to start to create a, a candidate backlash. Probably is my biggest concern is the mm -hmm. negative backlash. Just because of that pool of candidates are going to go back and talk to their colleagues, whether that's mm -hmm. a resident fellow or their 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 colleagues in, in whatever circle they communicate uh, mm -hmm. from that standpoint. Yeah. Paul, would you have any? No, yeah, I agree. I, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I realized early on is that, uh, you know, especially in the resident fellow pool that um, they talk and, you know, just because you may be recruiting family medicine doesn't mean that they don't, that, that re, you know, those residents don't have friends 
you know, who are fellows or res residents in other specialties. Uh, and, uh, and again, I'm confident there are people on this call right now that have gotten referrals from physicians they've reached out to that were not interested in their role, you know, but their roommate was, or, you know, they had a good friend who was. And you know, I think the best, you know, course of action is always to say, you can ask anyone anything or, or, or say anything to anyone as long as it's done in a professional manner. And yep, I totally agree. Uh, there's more, um, there's more talk and there's more sharing of experiences, especially strong among the candidates that are residents or fellows. And then kind of wrap it up. This goes to the, the, the assertiveness. Once again, we kind of talked it above, you know, it, it is truly when you, when you kind of wrap this, this side of it, of it is the effective communication it is listen to the candidate. You know, if you, if you're listening to them, you're going to know what's best for them, whether they take the, the opportunity or not, once again, what we just talked about in the bad way, they will listen to you in the good way and they will refer, they will come back, whether that's the job for them now or the job for them later or a colleague, they will, they will, they will appreciate that. You know, building that rapport, you know, and that trust is such an important step, you know, from that, that standpoint, we see it in our sourcing team here where we get candidates that, that refer people back to us. Um, we'll put a phone call in and because the way we conduct our business and how we try to build it as a consultative call, because uh, we're calling as you during that during that process, we're being very consultative on that call. We're doing the same thing. So we're calling and we're being very consultative, very, very open, very assertive. And that's the same process. And and so we see the same engagement and the same process through that. And reputation, you want to make sure that that stays solid across that that candidate pool, and and they know that you're listening and following through. If you lose the candidate because of offer, it is what it is, but they're going to remember that you worked on it. Um, that skill set that you're going to you're going to take with you is that negotiating skill. You know, you got to have that effective decision making. You know, um, from that standpoint, you got to be very efficient in it, proactive, proactively address the concerns. Um, you, you probably in some point in your career, whether it's here in another one, we've all been beat by someone who addresses concerns very quickly. I know I have, um, you know, not, not necessarily recently here, but there are definitely people that have beat me out, whether it's in another point of my career or not, that, that proactively address concerns a lot quicker than I did. And whether it's in a sales, uh, in, in a sales process or, or whatever, you know, that, that they were good. And they were quicker. They addressed the concern, and they beat us to the business. So I think that that fits across the line, no matter what we're talking about, you know. And 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 clients and customers, they all remember that. Remember, the physician is our client at this point. So you know, kind of remember that. And 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 if you start to build that trait, that's going to empower, you know, yourself to kind of build that that rapport with the physician. They're going to remember it, and and they're going to you're going to start to build that relationship across the board. That's going to increase your referrals. They're going to talk about it in that, in that pool of individuals. And I think that's going to effectively grow you as a recruiter. Thanks, Clint. So let's talk about passive recruitment. Right? Let's talk about a lot of what we see, right? And, and, Again, the passive side of this is, um, you know, the, just the job posting, right? It is, it is about not really taking that assertive action to find out, you know, what the candidate pool is thinking about your organization, what they're thinking about your opportunity. Um, you know, again, here's some examples, right? You know, online presence with job postings, targeted advertising, employer branding. It's great stuff. It has to be there. Like that passive recruitment does work, right? The APPR data tells us that, you know, still about 48% as of last year of the jobs that were filled were done by job postings only. The difference is, is that referrals are way up, right? They're up over 30% now for referrals to jobs that are open in the market. That's a really strong testament to the fact that, you know, the assertive communication, right, the, the reasons for more of an active recruitment process is so key. And again, it becomes more an, an assertive 
um, behavior of the recruitment team. And one of the things, you know, that was really important is that, you know, there are many candidates that are going to say, no, no, thank you. I'm not interested in your role. And this subtle difference, the subtle action can make a huge difference for your organization, which is simply saying to that candidate, that's okay. I respect your comment. However, what do you think about the role if it was in the geographic area you were looking? What do you think about the role if it was something that you would be interested in? We started that with our client sourcing team almost two years ago. And the difference for you, I can promise you this, by asking that simple question, which is a subtle, assertive approach to recruitment, but asking that question and having the opportunity to do that will give you information back about what the candidate pool is thinking about your roles. And it can be extremely powerful in terms of having an understanding of whether or not what you're writing about your roles or how you're speaking about your roles that you have open, whether or not they're really hitting the target market. And that's not possible only with the job post. Yeah, we've had plenty of um, opportunities that we have worked on where just asking that one question, whether it was, I mean, there's some things you don't, you can't control. Location, mm -hmm. right? You can't control that. Um, but we've had plenty of um, feedback of let's say compensation, sign on bonus, that once we've gathered enough of that and we've had our biweekly meeting with our client, or if we've gotten enough of that within a week and we have our, our, a quick meeting with our, with our client to go through that, because remember we're calling as you, they go, okay, let's take that to leadership. That's an easy fix, especially if you're losing great candidates that we, then we can call back and go. And a lot of them, obviously, we don't let them off the hook. We say we're going to let us get with our boss. I'm doing bunny ears. You can't see it. And, and let's see if we can do something about that. But once again, that's great feedback. If you don't know that and they're mm -hmm. just they're just not hitting the apply button because they just see that as a no, no, nah, I don't want that compensation. You, you're never going to find out that information. I agree. Yeah, so we might be to a point right now, you're thinking to yourself, okay, this is all fine and dandy, but what's next, right? So the daily applications, right? This is soft skills. So this is an opportunity to look through your recruitment process, right? And actually ask, you know, those who are working the process, maybe yourself included, you know, how many questions am I asking? Right. And it's the first thing to really kind of take a hard look at. And you don't need a software tracking for this. You don't need a spreadsheet for that. I mean, it's just a matter of saying, you know, looking over a week's worth of work and saying, what questions did we ask back to the candidates? What what questions did the candidates ask us? Do, did we identify an opportunity in, in, in our process right now to go to that physician leadership or go to that service line or look at the process for the, um, for the site visits, you know, scheduling that site visit and say, you know, just off the top of my head, I know, right, we could have had a, a question asked there or we could have been more of a candidate advocate to get them farther along the process. You know, so you know that. So that is the first step here, right, is to say, you know, wow, do we have the things in our process, in our conversations that we need to move the candidates along? Right. But more importantly, you can get a little bit more detail. And I mentioned that just earlier, right, about the questions. You know, but the second bullet point here under ask, I think this was really an important shift that we saw here uh, with our team. Right, is asking the candidates, you know, our, what's important for you to reach your professional and personal goals? Extremely powerful question. And it's very engaging. And again, you can't just get that from a job posting, right? You have to have these conversations. And again, shifting a lot of the conversation and the questions that are more candidate centric, you know, find out what the, from the candidate what's important to them. And, you, and sometimes, sometimes we have seen on more than one occasion that the compensation is important, but it's not necessarily the ultimate driver. And again, it goes back to what we talked about is having some additional information about your job postings, about your job opportunities that you may be able to make changes or make some pivots to be able to have more engaging conversation or, 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 or moving that candidate further through the pipeline. 
Any thoughts on that, Clint? No, I'm good. And assertiveness leads to confidence. And this is absolutely true. I have seen this with uh, the new members of the team here on the client sourcing team over the last three years. I saw this with myself uh, when I first started uh, managing the team uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. And I saw I see this in myself, you know, even to today. Right. Having just the confidence to say, you know what, I've got some questions for you. I think that you might be a good fit. Right. I know. Right. To arm yourself with data. I know the different aspects of what our opportunity offers. I know the call schedule. I know how, you know, the OB guy position interacts with our surgical uh, general surgeons and with our anesthesia. Right. Going to a different level. Right. Having the assertive conversations, though, can be a little um, intimidating for those who don't have as much experience in recruiting, but it's extremely important, right? Because having that assertiveness, right, it definitely leads to confidence. I have seen this over and over again, and I'm sure that there's people on this call who've had the same experience. And then the last point here, again, we talked about it earlier, but man, the candidate feedback is powerful data, right? It can move your organization. It can move leadership decisions, but without being assertive and not really engaging the candidates, right, or engaging the process, right, and knowing possibly if you have some hang up somewhere in your process that is, you know, keeping you from being as competitive as you could be regarding candidate engagement, it's helpful to have that feedback, you know, from the team to be able to look at that and make some real good strategic decisions about how you're engaging your candidate pool. Very good. Clint, I think you have a story here, don't you? Well, I mean, I have all kinds of stories that we can. <laughs> I don't know if we want to share all of them right here. No, you know, I think as we jump into the, the, the second part, the second part of the of the webinar, you know, we, we, we're going to jump into mastering confidence and, and you'll see how it kind of fits. And, you know, I, I'm always pretty blunt. Uh, you know, some of you, I, you know, I, I'll look through the who all attended and. I'm sure there's plenty of you that have met me and probably a lot of you that haven't. And I, I look forward to whether it's at our conference or conferences down the line that hopefully we're able to meet down the line and, and uh, you know, and, and that. But um, I'm always very honest if, if you've when you have a phone call with me uh, and hopefully we do. But, you know, I think confidence is is always one that that is is hard sometimes to to think about. And how do you master it? Um and once again, I'm always very honest. Uh, and the one I like to talk about, and it doesn't matter if it's me moving from a VP to a to a COO or to a CEO, is like there's 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 times in which you have to think about, you know, where is that where's that confidence at? How do you master that confidence? Because outwardly, you can look as confident as as you can because you have to, but you you have to sit there and 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 really look inward and and try to think about where and what you have to work on to master what your trade is and and I've had to do that you know I I you know now coming into my third year of running you know practice match there's been a lot of growing that 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 I've had to do here going from the CEO to the CEO and and that took a lot of mastering of the confidence. I'm very confident from an operation perspective, but it's a lot different from an operation to going to actually being a CEO and running a company. And, you know, because there's a lot of other responsibilities and my leadership and I got a couple of them on this call would all agree. And it's not that we're, you know, that there's anything wrong, but it it is something that all of us need to do. And when we when we think about whether it's recruitment, whether you're a director on this call, whether you're you're a, a, a manager of recruitment or just a recruiter, you know, I think that when you step out and you really think about how I need to grow, how I need to master what I'm part of, I do think that that it's important for everyone to step back and say, this is what I'm doing, whether it's my career, whether it's personal, and how do I want to how do I want to move forward? And how do I want to gain the confidence? Because it, it, I think that's what propels you to be successful. And once you know and identify the areas in which you're not, and then you come up with a plan 
then I think that's where you start to see your success. And that's kind of how we built a little bit of the next slides. Um, Cause I did that. I, you know, it's something that you just don't know what you don't know until you're in the middle of it. Um, and, and that's kind of a little bit of, of my journey, you know, from that standpoint without getting too much into the weeds. Thanks, Clint. So when you look at, at mastering the confidence, you know, I always talk about identifying the gap and I kind of just said it. So when you look at, as a recruiter, if you're a recruiter on the call, you know, you look at the, you look as a recruiter and, 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 and you know, once again, I say I have industry in here, but you look at your role and now you start to say, what am I lacking in knowledge? Paul hit on it on a couple slides up, or it might've been the, the last slide there is like, if you're sitting in your organization right now and you were thrown into this role here recently, um, or you're new to this industry, uh, kind of the stats that we're starting to see of people that are new to recruitment, you know, don't sit there and just spin your wheels and not ask questions. You have to start to acknowledge right. where is your lack of knowledge? What don't you know? Because I, for one, when I came in this industry eight and a half years ago, I'm like, oh, this will be a cakewalk. What, what, what different? I'm in, I have an engineering degree. Well, I'm, I'm smart. And then all suddenly people started using all these words, which is all these specialties. And I went, wow, I've got to learn a lot. And then they started using these crazy things like Da Vinci machines and all this other stuff. I'm sure Paul's in his office laughing at me right now. <laughs> I am. And I'm like, <laughs> I have no idea what these people are talking about. So I need to step back and I need to start learning. And I can't even imagine you guys as recruiters of what you have to know. And, and so when I say mastering confidence, you have to step back and identify the gap. And I think that has to go a long way with where you are able then to talk to a recruiter or to a physician, I should say. As a recruiter, you have to identify that, build your list. What do you know? What don't you know? Where do you need to lead? If, if, you, if it was knowledge, what can you gain from your leader or your peers? You have to acknowledge that gap. And, and, and it can be difficult. Um, it, it, sometimes it's hard to, to come and basically say that I don't know what it is, but it's also, if you don't acknowledge it, it's also very hard to move forward. Um, compare, you know, kind of compare yourself with your peers, you know, and, and what I mean by that, that's in terms of recruitment. Focus, you know, a little bit on, on you know, what should be, you know, on the developing side of, of, of your craft you know, in, in broad, you know, what do I need to work on? Is it understanding the medical, you know, terminology? Is it is it understanding my organization? Is it understanding, you know, all of what we offer? You know, additionally, understanding the workflow, you know, encompassing all aspects of of, of the clinic and and that. And then, you know, from from the last part is is looking at it from, you know, all structures, you know, of of the industry and pulling every single thing in uh, and then just start to pick it apart uh, is, is probably my number one is, is going back and literally picking apart every single thing you don't know, especially if you're new, you know, from that and, and really identifying that gap and is critical. We have a lot of employees that are very proud, even here. And it, the hardest thing for them to do is to come and say, I don't know something. And, I will always tell anyone, I have no problem with someone coming to me and asking for help. It's obviously if people don't retain is always the, the most frustrating thing, you know, from that standpoint. Yeah, I can, you know, that's, that's a great point, Clint. Um, you know, I am confident uh, it would be a miracle if, uh, if all of us who are on this call right now compared our backgrounds and said, yeah, uh, two or three of us actually line up and have the exact same background coming into physician uh, recruitment. It just it just doesn't happen. I mean, I think we laugh about that when we're at our national meetings, you know, at all of us who are on this call, right, or at a local meeting to, to compare our backgrounds. And we come from all over the place. And, um, you know, Clint, I mean, you you'd spot on, um, you know, myself, right? I had about 15 years of experience in um strategic planning, business development in healthcare, you know, in, in the, uh, you know, in the um, healthcare organization, 
you know, with, with academic centers, you know, I've seen a lot, but when I took the role in, in uh, a <laughs> director of recruitment, you know, I was inheriting the people that were recruited and I realized I didn't know, I didn't know how physicians look for jobs. I mean, I'm dead serious. And for the first six months, I asked a lot of questions. I spent time with physicians that came to the organization, asked them how they looked for their jobs, asked them how, you know, what, the, how, why they chose our organization over the other competitors in our market, spent some time getting some coaching from my peers, you know, but it took about six months and, uh, you know, I never looked back and uh, it, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's that assertive conversations, right? Come out of the confidence and asking the questions about the things we don't know, right? again, or, and those are on the call, right? If you know you have new staff, you know, if you have people new to the, new to recruiting, yeah, you know, the confidence will come, you know, as they learn more about the, the, the subtleties of the specialty that they're recruiting or about the industry as a whole. So then when you kind of building the confidence, it, it's, it's, this is a very simple graph. You can find this anywhere. Actually, it was in one of the books I read a long time ago. So I kind of stole it a little bit. Um, it, it's the basic pyramid. You have to self-reflect, you know, on, on where you're at. You have to take that moment, consider, you know, where you're at, you know, what activities, you know, where you excel and then find, you know, where that, where that fulfillment is. You have to seek input. Um, it's very critical that you have to go out there and 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 ask for for valuable perspectives on your strengths, on your weaknesses. You have to go to your colleagues, your mentors for feedback, and you have to make sure that you are willing to accept their feedback. And I think that's more important than most things. Um, you also have to leverage your strengths. Um, once you identify your strengths and, and that, you have to leverage them. Um, continuous growth. If you're going to do this, you have to dedicate the time um, to, uh, to honing your skills. Uh, expand your knowledge. And you have to, you know, if you want to remain competitive in any field, whether you're, you're here for now and you're looking to move, you have to, you have to sit there and expand your, your skill and your knowledge, you know, and you have to, you have to can do that continuous growth. Um, you have to collaborate, um, acknowledge, acknowledge where, where you have to partner with individuals who are strong and, and definitely work on collaborating with those individuals that you have identified, uh, be authentic. This is kind of an interesting one, but this was, this is one I really, really liked within the read that, that I did a while ago, but embrace your uniqueness. Um, that sets you apart. Um, you know, from others, uh, and, and don't let it don't don't be like others. Take your uniqueness and and make it you. Um, welcome the challenge. Don't avoid, you know, the challenges out there. I have definitely had plenty of of challenges through my whole careers. I and I've been lucky. I've only had three um, throughout um, three three careers technically, uh, multiple stops within each career uh, or each business I've been in. But um, you know, welcome the challenge. Don't avoid them. You know, it will strengthen you all the way through your 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 careers that you're you're working on right now. The obstacles that are out there will grow you, and you'll you'll see it. And then adapt and grow. You know, be flexible with the change, um, because if you're not, you're not going to move any further. You're not going to strengthen, and and you've got to be objective to do that. Thanks, Clint. And then the the last part on this is is you've got to be able to to set clear goals, you know. So as you build it, you've got to set the clear goals that are out there, you know. Um, from that standpoint, you've got to set them, and you've got to have a a a clear time frame, uh, from that standpoint. Um, if you're not, then it's not a real goal. Um, so just be 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 aware of that. Be proactive, you know. So when you're looking at it from a proactive Per stand, you know, you know, perspective. Don't, you know, wait, you know, from that standpoint. So if you're putting it in in a recruitment perspective, don't wait for the position to become vacant. Continuously look at the pipeline. So, you know, from the confidence perspective, stay organized. You know, you've got to stay organized from that standpoint of 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 that of that side of it to stay confident. Build the relationships. 
you know, these are all very simple, but they just escape our mind when we're not, when we're not staying aware of our surroundings. Um, you know, stay informed. This industry changes, the trends change. You can look at the report from year to year, you know, stay, mm -hmm. stay informed of what's going on on the trends. You know, this will allow you to adapt, you know, to, to what's going on, you know, measure your performance, especially if you're looking to change, you know, make sure you're measuring um, everything that's going on. And then going back to the continuous learning, um, reach out, whether that's on the tools in which you use, whether that's on the skill set in which you're trying to use, whatever it is, make sure you're continuously learning from your network, your peers, um, whatever tools you have, make sure you're continuously learning. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, if I can just come in on five, six, and seven. Um, yeah, staying informed is uh, is huge. Uh, you know, I I look at the candidate pool uh, like a school of fish, right? It just moves around on its own. It, you know, we we have to be honest and look back and say, where did this four day work week come from? Right? It didn't come from us. Right? It came from the candidate pool. Right? About those. Right, residents and fellows talking, right? The attendings talking at you know at their national meetings, at their you know, through wherever they may be, right? Talking among themselves and saying, Hey, I just, you know, I just had an offer for a 40 work week. I just had an offer for a 40 work week, and it caught fire, right? It wasn't the best thing for all of us on this call, right? It stresses the um the coverage issue, but that's where it came from. And wow. and the candid pool continually changes. Yeah. And staying and informed. Yep. No, go ahead, Paul. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, and then the second thing is, is, you know what, we haven't talked about it yet, but uh, I'm going to skip over to continuous learning right here. Here it's practice match, you know, and I came in and I started, you know, and you can rip this off because I ripped this off from somebody else. Right. I just started meetings called continuous professional development meeting. We meet once a week for about a half an hour and for the whole team. And it allows it, it allowed us to start sharing, in a, in, you know, in an environment questions. And taking advantage of some of the things that as a team we were, you know, we needed to be better at or need to needed to know more, needed to know more of. And it sounds pretty straightforward, but it makes and it has made a huge difference, you know, over time. These profession continuous professional development meeting was just a great place, you know, to start to compare notes among the team and to start to understand, you know, where we needed to be better informed or where we needed to spend some time, you know, learning about certain specialties. And then going back to six, the measuring the performance, you know, it is something that, you know, I'm not seeing a lot of in terms of concrete, uh, you know, benchmarking on, from national statistics and and you know, having KPIs in place for the team, you know, to say, if we make changes, if we educate, if we are more assertive, you know, are we making a difference? Well, and, and that's where I was going to go, Paul, is every single one of these technically can go back from a recruitment perspective, because I, I think that's where I would go is that every single one of these we struggle with with recruitment because the, the clear goals, the proactive all fit within recruitment, yeah. which we can make a whole different talk. So. Oh, absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. Okay. Next slide. Yeah. Ownership of the recruitment role, right? That's that, that is the, the confidence builder will, you know, equate into you know, anyone, anywhere in the process, sourcing recruitment, right? A coordinator for scheduling, uh, you know, all of the, all of the surrounding activities that it takes to get a candidate engaged and, and move through your process. Absolutely. You know, the confidence will build ownership of that particular role. Right. And we talked about this first point is improving knowledge where, you know, you may lack it. You know, and we know, right. Even with a brand, somebody brand new to recruiting, I mean, there's a difference between what's the best way to connect to a emergency medicine physician. Well, it's, it's any day because you have no idea what schedule they're working Right. Versus, you know, if it's family medicine, you know, it's not going to make sense to try to connect with them outside of the lunch hour or after work because they are, you know, a four day or a five day work week, you know, nine to five, basically. Right. And having those that just that slight bit of knowledge about those two specialties alone can also make a big difference in terms of being confident and being assertive in communication. You know, and, 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 and going to new specialties, right, and having the opportunity to learn more, right? And then the conversations with the candidates can be more confident, right, and can be more assertive. 
you know, having a better understanding again of that particular specialty and, and, and the work schedule and what it's like in the day in a life of that particular physician. Right. And the last thing too, right? The attending physicians, we know that attending physicians versus a fellow and a resident, those are different conversations. And I didn't know that right away. I didn't realize that right until that, that six months I was talking about in terms of I was learning the difference in terms of conversations with physicians looking for a job. The attending conversations are much different than the fellows and, and the residents. Right? They, and, you know, without getting into the details, those of you on the call who know the differences are, are pretty straightforward. The attendings know how they want to practice. They know what they want to do and they know what they don't want to do. Residents and fellows tend to want to, you know, they're looking for their new job. They're not feeling as confident. And, they, and, and sometimes they say they want to do everything that they've learned in their training. And we all know, right, that that just isn't how it always ends up working out in the long run. So without getting too much detail, you know, those are the things, you know, that are important. And those are the things that if you have a continuous professional development meeting weekly, those are the things that start to flush out. It's celebrating success. You know, I mean, I can't, I don't know about you, but um, I didn't, you know, I didn't get a lot of hugs and I didn't really get a lot of high fives uh, on a monthly basis walking down the administrative corridor hallways a lot, you know, even though we were successful, right? Because it's all about, you know, there's always that churn, right? We always have something new we're recruiting for. There's always something that is just dragging longer than we want to. Right. We've got those positions who have, you know, a pipeline right to the VP or to the CEO, you know, who, you know, we get asked again, you know, what's going on with our job. Right. But more importantly, you know, it is important to celebrate the successes, whether or not it's through social media posts and LinkedIn talking about how amazing the team is or something, you know, that that, that your organization has done really well. Right. And this kind of comes back to the metrics, you know, having those benchmarks. And having those KPIs is 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 a way for the team to self recognize the things that they're doing well. It's easy for you know the leadership of the of the department to basically come back and say, "Man, we're moving the needle," and we know because we're we're measuring that, right? Or celebrating successes in terms of reducing the amount of variation that you have between the seven or ten different specialties, you know, service lines you're you're recruiting for, and knowing that it's not all over the board in terms of you know how you're getting the candidates through the process. And more importantly, celebrating, you know, celebrating with others. You know? And if you want to go outside the organization, again, right, you can do it. We've done, we did it at the organization I came from. We had a town hall meeting on a quarterly basis, you know, and we did talk about the successes that we we're having in, you know, with the recruitment. You know, we still had things on the on the docket that were moving slowly and we we're struggling with, but there are plenty of things to celebrate. So if you're not doing it, I encourage it. It's something simple something a little bit more complicated, something you want to post on LinkedIn, it's it's a solid move and it makes a big difference. The last thing is accountability, right? What does it mean for the recruiter, right? Again, embracing, if you have KPIs, right? I encourage you to have them or benchmarks, right? It's the ability to say, yes, you know what? I know how I'm doing, but it also keeps, it, it keeps you accountable. Right. It allows you as a director, right? Or as a as a as a recruiter right in the trenches, right? It, it allows you to understand how am I doing? You know, if you know, and if there's if there's again, it allows you to identify different specialties where you know they might be outliers, both on the good side. Like, why are we moving candidates so quickly through this particular specialty? Like there's a reason for it and, and it's helpful. It can be a learning and say, whoa, if we can replicate this over a number of different specialties, we can recruit our time, our time to hire. And then again, that's a number two, right? Identifying the bumps and bottlenecks for sure. And the last thing is KPIs. You know, we talk about that, you know, and we certainly have a way to be able to help you uh, put those in place, but more importantly, they're very fluid and they don't have to be the same thing for the whole year. They can change, you know, you can change it from month to month, I don't rec you know, or you can change it from quarter to quarter, but it, you know, as you become better at, and as you identify more opportunity to work on something and have a way to measure how you're moving on it, the key, you know, key performance indicators are huge. 
And, the, di and the, the difference between a KPI and a goal, right, is the KPI is more of a lead indicator, right? If you see how that's going, you can definitely project how things are going to be, you know, have come out on the backside of what you're measuring. Any thoughts on that, Clint? No, let's get some questions if they have any. Yep. Do we have any suggestions on the leadership team that doesn't want to share the job descriptions and the details of the position, call duties, schedule, equipment, et cetera? Um, I mean, I can make two comments about that. Um, it's difficult and it will present to the candidates a feeling of um, not sharing that information. It is going to impact your engagement. Pretty confident you already know that. Um, it's important. I would be willing to have a conversation with your organization about the fact that on a national basis, over the last three years, I've seen a lot of organizations have a lot of different approaches. And I can tell you with confidence, yes, we can tell you that the engagement from the candidate pool is going to suffer without having as much information as possible up front about a role. And that's what I would, that's, and that is my answer to your question is data moves organizations, data moves titles. It's hard to argue with that when the data is showing that that is the case. So if you need some help on that, feel free, you know, to connect with me or I'll connect with you after this to have a more detailed conversation about that. Any other questions? Any, any thoughts? Please ask. All right. Uh, go to the next well, one. Clint, good job. Uh, right, I'm right at the. Uh, Right at the hour. You can go to the next slide. I think it has our contact info. Yep. Um, even myself as the CEO, I'm very assess inaccessible to all of you. So feel free if you have questions, concerns, feedback. I have no problem. If you want to email me. Uh, my email has my contact info. I'll respond. You guys can call. Yeah, I'll be more than happy to, um, you know, and answer any questions that you may think about, you know, maybe at the end of the week or maybe even next week as you're noodling things around, um, talk about KPIs, talk about benchmarking or really, you know, can go into more detail about, you know, how we go about um, or how I can, you know, help you just, you know, understand like how to go about uh, measuring and, and being able to move, uh, you know, with your with your team to be more assertive and be more confident. Uh, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the week.